Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, Series 2000. This week, I'm excited to visit Cry of the Cat. I'm definitely less familiar with the Series 2000 books across the board, but there are a handful that I have vague memories of checking out from the library as a kid. Cry of the Cat was one of them. It's a solid introduction to the new darker series. It wastes no time getting to the meat of the story with some zombie cat antics. I will say, if you're sensitive to descriptions of animal violence, this might not be the book for you. The opening scene with Rip the Cat getting hit by a bike was pretty rough. Aside from that, it's definitely one you should check out if you're on the fence about the new series 2000. There actually was some merchandise this week to drum up some interest in the new series, like this Cry of the Cat poster, a Return to the Training Card book tear out, a notepad that came with a fan club pack, and speaking of the fan club, it was also featured on the shipping box. I also found this t-shirt featuring Cry of the Cat, and since it's giving late 90s graphic design is my passion, I think it's legit. In the back of the book, we have more about the Fan Club 2000, which has things like a baseball hat, stickers, decals, notepads, posters, and four themed postcards to mail out to your friends, or just a hoard for yourself. Also, again, we have this promo for Sail with the Stars featuring Arl Stein himself. It'd be cool to find someone who actually went on this cruise so they could tell us what it was like. Our front take says, Dead Cat Walkin', which is a play on Dead Man Walking, and I don't see a back tag this week, just promo for the Series 2000 itself, so let's read the blurb on the back. In the light of the full moon, I saw the cat sprawled on its back, its head twisted to one side, its forepaws straight in the air. Even from my bedroom window high above the ground, I recognized the cat, the cat named Rip, and I knew without going down there that I had killed it again, killed it for a third time. Okay, let's start this summary. The book opens with a bit of a fake out. We have two mystery siblings who are in the midst of a cat attack. We have a very descriptive scene as a beastly black cat grows to the size of a dresser and hunts these two kids down. It peaks with the boy getting pinned to the ground by the cat as it sinks its fangs into his shoulder. That's when it's revealed it's only a movie. Our actual protagonist, Allison, pops the tape out of the VCR and tries to console her terrified five-year-old brother, Tanner. We learn Tanner always rents scary movies, but can never handle actually watching them. Allison ends up leaving for theater practice, and Tanner makes her promise to finish the video for him so she can tell if the two kids survived the cat attack. It should also be noted this scary movie was titled Cry of the Cat, so I wonder if this will play into our plot later on. We also learn Allison is a big fan of mice and has a collection of hundreds of little mice figurines and merchandise, which is convenient for a book centered on cats. Allison meets up with her platonic bestie Ryan, and they bike on over to the school on her new bike that she got for her 12th birthday. I was kind of thinking maybe the protagonist would move on to age 13 for series 2000, but I guess 12 remains the mandatory Goosebumps age. Allison and Ryan are having a grand old time singing songs from their upcoming play when the book takes an abrupt and graphic turn. Allison is nearly hit by a red van, and in the process of dodging it, she runs over a cat with her bike. And then I saw a blur of gray in front of my bike. A cat? Yes. No time to swerve. I tried to brake, but my hand slid off the handle. No, the cat darted out in front of me. I felt a hard bump under my front tire. Then I heard a harsh squeal of pain. It all happened so fast, but I saw it all. The cat under my bike tire, the cat's body under the wheel, a scrape, a squish, his head, the cat's head came flying off the body. I saw the wide open eyes, the mouth pulled back in surprise. I saw the cat's head flying into the air, and then I toppled from my bike. Stein quickly dials this back a bit, but not by much. She didn't actually decapitate a cat with her bike tire, but she definitely did kill it. We know this because we have plenty of detail of its dead limp little body and a little pink tongue sticking out. I guess Stein wanted to raise the stakes in series 2000 right off the bat, because we for sure haven't had a scene like this in the original 62, and it's only like page 10. Allison wants to do the right thing and find the cat's owner to explain what happened, while her friend Ryan is still obsessing over getting to rehearsal on time. They spot a creepy old house with the front door wide open and deduce maybe the cat escaped from there. Ryan then quickly decides this is an Allison problem and ditches her so she can go up to this house by herself. Some friend Ryan is. Allison is still clearly distraught and he's just like, bye. As Allison is approaching the door, she notices dozens of cats roaming the house and peering out the windows, all wailing mournfully like they know what Allison just did to their comrade. She briefly considers just leaving the cat on the porch and running away, but a girl her age named Crystal suddenly appears at the door. Allison just bluntly says, I'm sorry, I killed your cat, which results in the girl shrieking no, please no, as she mourns Rip, the name of the unfortunate cat. Shit then gets weird as Rip starts wiggling in Allison's arms and jumps down to the ground alive after all. Allison is in shock, and Crystal is just like, you should have not messed with Rip, he's no ordinary cat. Allison is entirely confused by all of this, and Crystal suddenly shifts her tone and is like, I don't want that cat back, I never want him back, and slams the door in Allison's face. Poor Allison is having a rough afternoon. She ends up heading to rehearsal and tries to update Ryan on the situation, but he's not getting the full gravity of it all, and is just like, well, sounds like a happy ending after all, the cat's alive, conveniently ignoring that Rip was full on dead earlier. We briefly meet the play director, Mr. Keynes, who is another in a long line of Goosebumps bird people, because he's described as a chubby owl of a man. 
The kids start to run through lines when Allison is frozen by a loud meow that nobody else seems to be able to hear. She tries to get the other kids to locate it, but they all think the bike crash must have rattled her brains. Eventually, the play moves on, except when Allison goes to open a stage door, she's suddenly attacked by a cat. It leaps onto her face and tries to bite her throat, causing her to yeet it across the stage with all her might. This results in the cat again dying a graphic death, as it's crushed flat by a prop thrown. Some little sociopath kid laughs and makes a joke about roadkill, as another runs off the stage before she pukes. When the kids lift the throne, it's revealed this flattened cat is actually Rip, the same cat Allison already killed once today. Ryan is like, that's impossible, and goes to pick up the squashed cat. Except once Ryan has a hold of him, Rip suddenly kicks his legs back to life, causing Ryan to drop the cat in shock, and Rip takes off again and vanishes into the auditorium. As Allison is leaving the school, kids begin meowing at her, because kids can be dicks sometimes. We jump to dinner time, and Allison is trying to share about her traumatizing day, but her parents are more concerned it's too gross for dinner talk, and the dad shifts to being enraged that Allison crashed her new bike. Did he miss the part where she was nearly hit by a van? Asshole. Allison's mom starts sneezing aggressively because she's allergic to cats. Allison offers to change her clothes in case they have cat dander on them, but the mom is just as mean as the dad and snaps at Allison to sit down and eat her chicken noodle soup that she worked all day on. This family has tension. Allison has a big mouthful of soup and immediately starts gagging because her mouth is now full of cat hair and she's already swallowed some of it. She looks down at her chicken noodle soup and sees lumps of great cat hair all mixed into it. Allison proceeds to hack up a glob of cat hair into her napkin and attempts to scrape it off her tongue while groaning that it's stuck in her teeth. This is so simple but effective, like this scene is full on nasty. Allison spends 30 minutes brushing the cat hair out of her mouth and when she enters her bedroom she's met with another disaster. Someone has trashed her mouth collection and thrown them all over the room. Her little brother Tanner enters the room and unlike our typical Goosebumps younger sibling, he's actually nice and concerned for his sister. We jump to school the next day and Allison is recapping the book's events so far to Ryan when we get a brief fake out scare as Allison overreacts to grabbing the wrong lunch bag. When she gets her correct lunch bag, we have another scare. This time Allison opens the bag to spot two yellow cat eyes peering out from the darkness of the bag. She freaks out and starts screaming about how there's a cat head in the bag, except now she's just losing it because Ryan pulls out an apple from the bag in confusion. Allison then has an uneventful rehearsal where she fears Rip will appear around every corner. That night she falls asleep quickly but is awoken when she realizes she's suffocating. She claws at her face, only to discover a cat has latched onto it and she's being smothered in its fur. She then has quite the battle as she tries to pry this cat off her face. Pools of blackness swirled all over my face. The black slowly brightened to bright red. My chest ached. My lungs felt ready to burst. With a last desperate sweep of my arms, I grasped the cat's furry back with both hands and tugged at it up an inch or two. My chest heaving, I sucked in a mouthful of air. The cat kicked and thrashed, but I kept my grasp on its back and lifted him higher. My temples pulsed. I sucked in another breath of air. I let it out in a whoosh and sucked in another, the sweetest breaths I've ever took. I started to feel a little stronger. Groaning, I pulled myself up, still gripping the cat in both hands. His four legs kicked furiously, his claws swiping viciously at my face, and he grabbed me again. No, I shrieked. I raised the cat high, and with a desperate groan, I heaved him across the room. Heaved him high, harder than I planned. I stared in shock as the cat sailed across the room and hurled out the open window. I heard him cry out, and then I heard a hard thud as he hit the ground below. Then silence. When she heads outside to investigate the cat, she already knows what she's going to find. It's again Rip dead for the third time, this time with a broken neck. She creeps up on him, praying that he'll actually stay dead, but he springs back to life and slices her leg good with his sharp little claws. She needs to trap this demon cat in a box and tape it shut. Allison hobbles back into the house, and once safely inside she inspects her wound, only to find white scratch marks on her leg without any blood, like phantom scratches. The next morning, she's trying and failing to explain the last night's events to her mother, but her mom sucks and can't be bothered to listen. While Allison is trying her best to get her mom's attention, she's been mindlessly eating breakfast, but when she looks down she's horrified to discover she's eaten three cans of tuna straight up out of the can. Fun fact, I used to eat tuna out of the can like a little goblin when I was in middle school too. Much to my own mother's disgust. At some point I outgrew that, I don't know when. At rehearsal that afternoon, the kids are all having a great time hanging out for an entire chapter, telling jokes and delivering typical Goosebumps banter, when this all comes to an awkward halt because one of the kids notices that Allison's been licking the back of her hand like a cat grooming itself. So this book is taking a fun turn. Not only is Allison being terrorized by a zombie cat, she's turning into a cat like Maureen Ponderosa. Mr. Keynes appears and he wants the kids to practice a balcony scene for the play. Allison spends some time climbing up some rickety middle school assembled scenery and is a solid 8 feet off the ground. She performs the scene. But when it comes time to climb down, she's overcome with the urge to leap down from the balcony and land on all fours, and does just that. Allison leaps off the balcony and terrifies an entire room full of people. She then takes off out of the auditorium before anybody can question her further. At home while making Tanner some dinner, Allison has a craving for a big bowl of milk, 
but this gets interrupted by another gross-out scene. Allison begins aggressively heaving as she's trying to get something out of her throat. She ends up arching her back and gagging with all of her force, resulting in a wet clump of fur plopping out because Allison just hacked up a hairball. She decides she's had enough of all this and needs to pay Crystal, the mystery cat girl, a visit that night. She races to Crystal's house where we have another unsettling cat lady scene as dozens of cats peer and yowl through the windows. Crystal doesn't want anything to do with Allison and says her mom doesn't want her talking with her. Allison blurts out that she killed Rip three times already, which causes Crystal to gasp and warn Allison that Rip has used eight of his nine lives and to stay away from him because now he'll be really desperate and slams the door in her face. She turns to find Ryan, who just so happened to spot her when riding by. She updates him on the Rip situation and begins walking with a purpose to somewhere she's never been. Ryan keeps asking where they're headed, but Allison doesn't know, she's just following some sort of instinct at this point. When they finally stop, they realize they're now at a cemetery, which seems fitting for a zombie cat book. Actually, it's not just any cemetery, it's a pet cemetery, which is even better. Allison is then drawn towards one gravestone in particular, which reads RIP 1981 to 1993, causing her to realize that RIP has been dead for years, that's why she can't kill him. Allison then gets feral with it and starts clawing at the ground to dig up RIP's bones. Ryan tries to stop her, but it's no use. Allison is full on primal and heaving the dirt up until she comes across a little cat coffin. Shit then gets even wilder. Ryan begs her not to open it, but she does anyways, and a cat leaps from the darkness of the coffin and onto her face. This would be a great jump scare in a movie. Allison claws it off because she knows Rip is trying to smother her again. Ryan is trying his best to help and ends up struggling to hold on to the thrashing cat while he tells Allison to run away. She goes to run but trips over the cat coffin just as Ryan drops Rip. Rip then raises up on his hind legs and lets out a deafening screech causing everybody to freeze. The entire pet cemetery begins to tremble as the ground shakes and tombstones fall over. Smoke begins to rise up out of the ground and it becomes clear Rip is raising an army of dead cats. How the heck are they going to adapt to this for an episode? I have to say, Series 2000 is starting out pretty strong. I had no idea what to expect with it, and I'm pleasantly surprised. I did not think we'd be raising an army of zombie cats, that's for sure. The smell of decaying meat fills the air, and I guess these cats are more ghosts than zombies because they begin to float and swirl around Allison like a ghost tornado. She's hesitant to run through the swirling ghosts, but eventually bursts through it in the clear night with the ghost tornado behind her. She takes off down the street without Ryan, who's nowhere to be found. She turns around and spots Rip chasing after her with the swirling cloud of ghost cats behind him. She ends up at Crystal's house and beats on the door until she answers. Crystal ends up telling Allison to get inside quickly and promises she'll save her from Rip. Crystal says her mom will be able to protect them and leads Allison to the basement, which causes Allison to take pause because it's like, why is your mom in the basement? But she has no choice and continues into the darkness. Crystal flips on some fluorescent lighting, which is never a good sign in a basement, and reveals some sort of laboratory. In the back of the room though, Allison spots Crystal's mom and it's not pleasant. I cut off my scream with my hand, and backed against the stone wall in horror. Mom had a woman's face, dark lips, a slender nose, dark oval eyes, but two pointed cat ears poked up from her stringy gray hair, and clumps of white cat whiskers bristled up from both cheeks. She shuffled closer. She wore a baggy black sweater over a long red skirt. Her right hand, her human hand, rested on her waist, but dangling from the left shoulder of her sweater was a fur-covered cat's arm, with a cat's paw at the end. A furry cat's tail trailed out from a hole in the back of her skirt. As she made her way towards me, I saw fur on the back of her neck. I couldn't hold back a moan of horror. Half woman, half cat. Crystal's mom was half human, half creature. Crystal's mom sounds kind of like Hermione after the cat hair and the polyjuice potion. Her mom then proceeds to walk over to Allison and lick some cat hair off her shoulder because she just wants to clean her up a little bit like a good mother cat. Allison tries to nope out of there, but it's too late. Crystal's mom orders that Allison be held down for Rip. That's where we get some explanation to these events, but it's a lot, so brace yourself. Crystal's mom had been doing some experiments on cats, but all the cats died and she buried them in the pet cemetery. Except for Rip, he was too strong to die and returned to the other cats as his slaves. We officially have slaves in this book, so at least we know Stein wrote this one himself. In order for Rip to continue his long life, he needs to steal it from people. When Rip scratches someone, they become a little more cat and he steals a little bit of their life. Crystal's mom has given so much of her life to Rip that she's nearly fully cat, and now she has no more life to give him, so he needs to take it from Allison. This all explains why Allison has been acting a little cat-like after getting scratched by Rip. Crystal's mom wasn't ready to sacrifice Crystal to Rip, so Allison will have to do. Rip appears at the top of the stairs with his posse of ghost cats and walks slowly towards Allison. She's able to break free of Crystal but has nowhere to run. She gets cornered against the basement wall as an army of ghost cats and Rip block her path. Just then, Ryan appears at the top of the stairs and proceeds to come bounding down and walks right through the wall of ghost cats, even though Allison is telling him to run away. Ryan then gets scratched on the arm by Rip before Allison can stop it. She then pulls a toy mouse from her pocket and heaves it at Rip. The ghost cats all think it's real and leap for it, causing the swirl of ghost cats to engulf Rip, smothering him to death I guess, because the cloud of ghost cats vanishes along with Rip, 
who has used up the last of his life getting trampled by ghost cats. Not really the ending I was hoping for, but it works well enough. Allison and Ryan then turn around and realize they still need to deal with Crystal and her mother. But don't worry, they decided to no longer be evil, and thank Allison for freeing them of Rip and then peace out forever. It then hops to a few days later, and Allison and Ryan are preparing for their first performance. We get a brief scare fake out with Tanner screaming at the hands of an enormous black cat, but it turns out he's just watching Cry of the Cat again. Allison and Ryan walk to school, but stop when Ryan suddenly gets on all fours and catches a field mouse with his teeth, and in a final page twist, Allison and Ryan wrestle for the mouse because they're both still part cat. We finally have an episode to look at this week after a brief hiatus. It's a two-parter, and I'm curious to see how on earth they're going to slide some of the events of this book into a TV-friendly episode, so let's just jump right into it. The episode opens with an ominous cat yell, which feels appropriate. It's giving strong exorcist vibes. Oh, I guess that's intentional. I am the pet exorcist. So far this is nothing like the book, unless this is all a VCR fake out. Alarm. You don't scare me, cat! It's really over. A movie set fake out, even better. Guess what? I'm calling my agent. Did I hear cut? There's some optimism. Allie, Cry of the Cat is one of the most successful books ever written. Allison is about to take the cat out. This Allison is definitely less likable than book Allison. Do you, I mean, did you have a brown cat? I think I ran over him. This isn't as effective as the soup, but still gross. <laughs> it's kind of fun seeing the slight changes from the book. Here, it's a closet scare on a movie set versus during the play. Or having her mouse collection trashed in the dressing room versus the bedroom. <gasps> no! What is it? I like that Rip is more zombie-like in this version. <laughs> Goosebumps green feels more fitting for these scratches than white. I think eating a raw fish is an improvement on the tuna scene. No problem, Larry. Ooh, would you like some bread with that? It's really hitting quite a few beats of the book. You know, it's, it's all... Allison? I like that the doctor just knows cat blood versus human blood. This looks like cat blood. This girl just lets herself into somebody else's home. Okay, so Allison has learned all about Rip and needs to go to his grave, but the movie just so happens to be filming there with Allison's replacement. I'm telling you, right here! <sighs> Where are the bones? This episode has actual explosions in it, and some special effects. I don't get paid enough for this. I'm really, really hoping we see a Catwoman. This way. Mom will help you. Mom? She's a scientist. Aw, she's beautiful. But all the experiments failed. Might say we're old friends. Oh, no. They're here for you. I gave him my life, and with each scratch, I became a little more like him. Cat anymore. But he kept coming back anyway. They're ready for you, Rip. They're all yours. I'm so sorry. Rip looks more like a rat than a cat. Rip being an arm puppet is really clear in this scene. Boo. 
I was hoping for another full-on explosion. Swallow the mouse. Just a little mouse snack for the last scene. Me too. Overall, I thought Cry of the Cat was a strong first entry for the series 2000. There's a noticeable shift towards a slightly darker tone, but still felt close enough to the original 62 that it was a comfortable transition. This book has quite a few highlights to it, with Allison developing some cat-like behaviors, cat hair and chicken noodle soup, eating Rip out the window, a mutant cat woman in the basement, and Rip literally raising an army of ghost cats from Pet Cemetery. I was surprised with how detailed Stein was with Rip's initial death. It felt pretty graphic for the target demographic, but it did set the tone for the rest of the book with Rip's other deaths. The climax scene with a toy mouse and Rip being smothered by ghost cats was a bit ham-fisted, and I would have liked to see something with more effort behind it. I'm still going to give this one 5 out of 5 cans of tuna. This was a great first entry to the series 2000, and has me excited to see what else this series has to offer. Well, that's it for Cry of the Cat. Next week we have Bride of the Living Dummy, which I'm curious to see if Stein switches up the dummy formula for series 2000, or if it's just going to be more of the same. Let me know in the comments what you thought of Cry of the Cat. Which series 2000 books are you looking forward to, and which ones stink? Also, what did you think of my catty horror clips this week? I didn't realize cats leaping onto faces was such a thing in horror media. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love. <laughs>